Hey, thank you for um, coming in. Thank you for um, taking the time. I know your time is precious. And uh, you took the opportunity to do this with me, and I appreciate it. So I want to present you um, coming out of Matthew chapter 16 here in a little bit. Before we get there, though, I want to talk about a book that I've read to each of my children. I'm in the middle of reading it to Isaiah now. Uh, Pilgrim's Progress. You can see that. I don't know if there's a glare. John Bunyan had been arrested. And he was cast into prison. And prison in the 1600s wasn't like prison today. It was really horrible. And cold and damp and just, just terrible place. And while he was there, he wrote this book. And, you know, some of it visions, some of it um, creativity. But out of his suffering came this wonderful book. And it's this journey that this young man named Christian is on. And it's really just his walk through life. And he goes from the city of the destruction. He goes through the slew of despond. He ends up um, in this horrible, horrible place where uh, his life is being threatened. He's uh, been put on trial. He has been, uh, like I said, he was put in a dungeon and then he was tortured. Uh, he was encouraged to take his own life. Uh, the, the giant of depression is what it is. That giant was taking and um, basically wanting him to end it. And there's just all these wonderful chapters and there's wonderful um, illustrations in them too. Let me find something. There's a picture of him. That's a picture where he's dealing with Mr. Worldly. A man is all about the world. You'll notice on Christian's back, his his backpack is a very heavy burden upon him. And uh, in the story, when he gets saved, he's lifted of his burden. But he still continues his journey. Anyway, it's I recommend parents to read this to their children because what it does, it gives you an idea of what it's, it gives them an idea of what it's like to live life and have some things to expect. And they can be like Christian and go through those things with God's help. So anyway, um, I wrote, I read this to Levi and Abigail when they were seven, eight years old, around that time. Well, maybe a little younger, because I know that Adria was pregnant with Isaiah at the time. And now I'm in the middle of reading it to Isaiah. So it's a little bit of a tradition in my family. If you have children, grandchildren, oh, let me be clear though, it's not the original because um, you can't hardly read it with the old English being so difficult. This is a simplified version I, I read today. I'm also having a bridged, but the simplified version uh, breaks it down. At the end of each chapter, you have questions that you can ask your student um, what they thought about this. Who was the man in the picture who helped Christian? What does the law do? What does the young girl sprinkling water represent? All that kind of stuff out of here. And it really gets your children to think um, deeply about spiritual matters as they go through this journey with Christian himself. So I just wanted to plug this book. If you've ever had, if you hadn't ever read it, I want to encourage you to read it. Um, but if you have children, grandchildren, you could read it to them. And my kids always loved it. So, all right. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 16. We're going to do familiar verses that I've done before. And we're going to talk about um, the difference between committing to God and surrendering to God. All right. We'll do that here in a moment. All right, we're going to try to do this, do my best to do it. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, uh, 24 through 28. And I do understand that last time I put the wrong scriptures on the screen. I apologize for that. Did not mean to. Uh, sometimes we make mistakes. But I hope that wasn't too confusing for you because I know when, when we watched it at home ourselves, it was 
kind of confusing, so I apologize. Uh, Matthew 16, 24 through 28. And I'm talking about the difference between committing and surrendering. Uh, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to come with me, okay, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Verse 25. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life because of me will find it. What will it benefit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? Or what will a man give in exchange for his life? Verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in with his angels in the glory of his Father. Okay. And then he will reward each according to what he has done. I assure you, there are some standing who will not taste death until the Son of Man is coming in his glory. And that's talking about the transfiguration. Very interesting verse, that last one. But we'll, we'll stop at verse 27 and we'll get into commitment and surrender. Um, Adrian Rogers told a story one time where he was speaking to a Russian pastor and he asked him his impression of the American church. And he said one of the things that stuck out to him was in the American church, uh, they had replaced a word. They had replaced the word commitment, had started replacing the word surrender. And for a time there in all of Christendom, people didn't talk about committing to the Lord and making a commitment. That is a very American church phrase. It was all about surrendering, giving up, waving the white flag of surrender and doing that. Because uh, the problem is mentally committing gives you control. And you're a slave to Christ, so therefore, because you're purchased, therefore you do not have control. The slave does not have control. When I say to God, I am going to commit to this area of ministry or this area of my life, I am controlling that part of me. And instead of saying, God, whatever you want me to do, whatever it is, I will, I'm yours. Do with me what you will, you know. The attitude that they had in the Bible, all right, the very beginning of Romans, James, Second Peter, Jude, and Revelation. I'm going to read you the pieces of the very first verses. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus. James, the brother of Jesus. James 1.1, 1, 1, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Simon Peter, a slave of and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Jude, brother of Jesus. Jude, very first verse. A slave, Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. He didn't even mention I'm Jesus' brother, but I'm James's brother. He's so humble in that. And then in Revelation with John, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his slaves what must quickly take place. He sent it and signified it through his angel to his slave, John. So all that really confusing and neat and wonderful stuff in the book of Revelation. Uh, he said, I'm a slave. And it was given to me by an angel. So when you're in slavery, you don't have the free will. You don't have the choice in that. Now, I know the beautiful thing about being a Christian is you've been given the right to be called a child of God. And that's wonderful. But don't lose sight of what it took to purchase you. That He had to uh, lay down his life for you. He owns you. He bought you. He saved you And when he did that. And then he adopted us. And that's wonderful. But um, the call is a call of full surrender. Now back in Matthew where we started out in um, Matthew 16... In verse 24 through 27, particularly, those verses are about surrendering your life to him. Not committing, not, it's like, it's just giving up and letting him have it. When Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he gave us 
an example uh, in Matthew 26, 36 through 46. He said, not my will as you will. So not my will be done. So he wanted the Father's will to be done. That's my example. That's the way I should be. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. Paul said, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. So I'm supposed to emulate the attitude of Christ. I'm supposed to take my attitude, and we all have attitude, some type or another. My attitude is supposed to be that of Jesus, not of me. I'm supposed to replace me in that. So it, Paul went on to say in verse 7, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. So, God, in the form of Jesus, man, 100% man, 100% God, put off glory, came to the earth, and did this, and assumed the form of a slave. Even It says, even became obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. So, the attitude of Jesus is what I'm supposed to have, and what did Jesus do? Even though he was great. Even though he had wonderful authority and he was wonderful and a great God that he was there in the glory of heaven, what did he do? He came here and took on the form of a slave. So, really, Christianity and your salvation is not about you. It's not about you getting what you want. It's not about you getting your way. It has nothing to do with that. It's about him. It's about his will being done. Not my will, but your will. And we all have to get on board with that. Or we're doing Christianity wrong. If all it is is about me, 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 and what I can get. How often do our prayers start out being a thing of, God, I need this, or God, bless sister so-and-so, or God, we, what about him? What about God? What about what he wants? What about what he wants from you? How you are to live your life. How about learning more about him, growing? This is why it's so important that you mature and you develop in your faith, like we talked about last Sunday. Because if you don't mature and you don't grow, you're no good to the kingdom because you don't understand there's work for you to do. And there's you need to be... The baby in Christ cares only about themselves. Me, me, me. I'm hungry, I'm wet, I need milk, you know. Um, that's what babies do. You're supposed to mature and grow and be eating, eating meat and being teachers yourselves and being people who make disciples and doing all these things. So, in a twist, what's happening here is the way the world sees things and the way God sees things are very different and it's being revealed. In verse 25, when you're saving something, you're going to lose it. But that makes sense. But that's how it works in God's economy. Verse 25 says, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. You see, you can't do it yourself. You can't get the victory yourself. You can't do enough good works. You can't do enough deeds. You can't be whatever. You can't save your own life. You can't... In giving up everything... That's when you gain everything. That's the only way this works. That's why surrender works. It's not you working harder and harder to keep it and to do something with your own life. You need to be... What are you holding back from God? Okay? It's hard for human nature to grasp this. The rich young ruler in Luke 18.18 18 wouldn't let go. And he, he had an opportunity to follow, and he didn't. And that, so he, that's just an example that many of us are guilty of, not wanting to let go, holding on. And you know, especially if you've got a little bit of a control freak in you, you know you want to control your life and control things and hold on to stuff and hold on to how life is. And the whole time God's saying, I just want you to let go. I just want you to let go and trust me. I just want you to give it to me. You need to surrender. When you hold back, when you don't go into a full surrender, you're the one that's going to lose. You won't know him intimately. You won't know about him. 
And it's true in salvation. If you don't commit your life to Christ, you, you, you will not be saved through commitment. You get saved through surrender. You don't say, I'm going to give this part of me to Jesus. No, he wants all of you. He wants everything that makes you you. The essence of you. The, 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 your mind, your soul, your heart, your strength, your courage, your fear, your anxiety, your shortcomings. He just wants all of you. And He should get all of you because He bought you. He should get what He paid for. And why would you, after being saved, after being redeemed, made right with a holy God, hold back from Him anything is it that you don't trust him? Is it that we think really we can do it ourselves? There's certain areas, even I, you know, even I, especially I, uh, that I struggle, that not want to let go in, and and um, I'm sure you would love to know which ones those are, <laughs> but I'm I'm not going there. It, it's one of those issues that we all got things in us. Now some of it we've worked through. As we grow and mature and more time goes by, some of it we've worked through, but some of it we haven't yet, and some of it we're not even aware of. And if you grow and mature and read and study and listen to these things we're talking about and take the time to click on the videos and stuff, then hopefully I will help you develop and mature and Things like this will be revealed unto you by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, the preaching of God's Word, into your soul to realize, i got to quit holding on to these parts of my life and let God have them. See, salvation cannot be part works and part grace. Same thing with your Christian life. you got to give them all of you. I'm glad he's patient. I'm glad God is like King James said. He's long suffering uh, because we we're ridiculous. We are absolutely ridiculous that we hold on to things the way we do. It makes absolutely no sense. Why would we even do that? Okay, the next part, verse 25. So losing is finding. You know, if I lose something, I don't. That's not me finding something. But it is in God's economy. Verse 25 says, But whoever loses his life because of me. Don't lose that part. Whoever loses his life because of me, Jesus, will find it. Alright, so that's how it happens. you got to see through the deceitfulness of sin. you got to come to life uh, with a life-changing decision of understanding that you are going to do it God's way. Because uh, your flesh, you live in the world, you have a fallen sin nature, your flesh is fighting against you, the enemy is trying to persuade you to go against God, everything's working against you. So why do you think it's possible for you to do any of this yourself or to hold on to anything yourself? The truth is, you got to let go. And you got to let God. Think about Moses. Uh, Moses chose to identify with God's people. When he did that, he lost his position in Egypt. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 through 25. He, he was, you know, he had the education probably. He was living amongst them. He had the money. He identified with God's people. He lost all of that. He lost all those things that we try to gain. And he lost it. But what did he gain? Verse 26 talks about it. He, he, all the wealth of Egypt, all the stuff, could not compare to the wealth of God's rewards that Moses would receive. And praise God that he traded Egypt for God. Because... I mean, most of your Old Testament in the beginning and everything, Moses contributed so much to your life, to our Christian life, and Moses as a leader. And God could have raised up anybody else, but Moses, Moses did what he was told. 
there was a meeting a bunch of ministers got together and they wanted to have a type of revival at their in their town in their community and they were talking about getting dl moody to come and one of the young pastors said well, does D.L. Moody have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? And everybody got real quiet for a little while. And the old preacher got up and he said, No, D.L. Moody does not have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit of God has a monopoly on D.L. Moody. That, that illustration always stuck with me. Because that's where we need to be. Okay, we need to have let God have a monopoly on us. Just all of us, everything about us, everything that makes you you, God wants it. Here's the disciples when they're leaving everything, forsaking the world, and they go to follow Jesus. Luke chapter 18, verse 28. Then Peter said, look, we have left what we had and followed you. But the truth is they had not. Oh, physically, yeah. If you're sitting there and you're witness to this conversation when Peter says that to Jesus, look, we've left everything to follow you. It sounds good. It looks good, but it's not completely true. It really wasn't, if you, if you know your Bible, you understand it wasn't until after the resurrection. It's not until you get into the book of Acts where they're really following Jesus up to that point they don't really know what they're doing but they left the boats they left their careers they left the nets and they followed Jesus later though they're going to truly follow Jesus I was reading about uh, Admiral, Admiral Nelson when a French soldier came up to him and went into his tent stuck out his hand and Nelson recoiled his own hand and said you give me your sword and I'll give you my hand and what he meant by that was he wasn't trying to disarm the man he was saying you fight for me you prove to me you're gonna fight with me and fight for me I will give you my hand and I, I need to be like that I need to be like that with my God I need to prove and show I will fight for you I will you have my sword. I am in the battle. I am totally surrendered. You tell me to move left, I move left. You tell me to jump, I jump. You tell me to crawl, I crawl. I do what you tell me to do. You are my king. You are my ruler. I am your slave, and I humbly follow you and serve you. So you don't like that because we want to hold on to our own lives, and we don't like to think that God might change everything he might tell you to sell it all and move off in the middle of nowhere and be a missionary he might tell you see people are scared to death that if they fully surrender to god they'll have to go be a missionary doesn't mean you'll have to go be a missionary it might just mean you'll have to witness to that guy at work or actually do devotions with your children or actually serve him in the church or actually start giving and, and committing to your finances because you are surrendered to Almighty God. You see, there's things you need to commit to, but it comes out of a surrender of who you are. And if you have a hard time doing that, it's because you're not surrendered to God. You're not fully giving Him everything. Are you truly willing to say, by life or by death, you can take everything I got. You can do whatever you want to to me. I am your slave. I will follow you. He deserves nothing less than that kind of obedience. I know, hey, this, that's intense. Yeah, it is. It was intense when He was shedding His blood for you. It was intense when they were nailing Him to that tree. Then verse 26, profit is loss. See, in, in the world's economy, you make profit, that's gain. But in this, in God's economy, it's loss. What will it benefit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? Or what will a man give in exchange for his life? 
this version says benefit. Yours probably says profits. What would it profit a man? Um, that's a very difficult lesson. We see the world, but we cannot see the soul. God has put so much emphasis on the souls of human beings, all human beings, because all human beings matter. And all human beings are created in the image of God. So therefore, they are imagers of God. Therefore, there's nobody more important than anybody else. All human beings, all nationalities, all tribes, all tongues. See, the Bible doesn't talk about race. Evolution gave you race. The Bible talks about nations of people. In Luke 16, 13, Jesus said, no household slave can be the master of two can be the slave of two masters since either he will hate one or love the other be devoted to one or despise the other that's the problem you can't serve this world and serve jesus you can't serve you and serve jesus you gotta surrender and you gotta quit telling god what you're going to do for him and start asking him what he wants you to do for him when Elijah, in 2 Kings, he turned his back and from following him, he took the team of oxen and he slaughtered them. He burned up. Do you know how expensive oxen were in an agricultural society? That's a lot of money. That's like taking and tearing down two brand new tractors. He tore down oxen, tore down the plow. He made a barbecue and he fed everybody around and he said, see ya, I'm going to go serve the Lord. And he did. See, Jesus placed such an infinite value on human souls. How valuable is your soul to you? It was so valuable to God that he crushed his only son for you. That's kind of a big deal. So consider the cross and you'll see the value. Consider the nails. Consider the thorns. Consider the scourgings. Consider what it took. I know that salvation is easy when you look at grace and you look at how God extends the gift of salvation unto man. And we go, that's too easy. But it wasn't easy for Jesus. The one who went up on that hill, carried his cross, died for you. But he said, no man lays down my, no man takes my life from me. He laid it down freely, and he had the power and the authority to take it up again. He deserves your surrender. He deserves you to follow him. So are you willing to count it all loss to be gaining God? Because what are you going to do when we die anyway? You're going to be serving him, living for him. You're going to be in glory, doing different things for him. Heaven is about Him. It's not about you. Oh, I can't wait to go to heaven and see Mama and I won't have to work no more. Won't be any more sickness, no more crying. Yeah, that's all great. But heaven ain't about you. The truth is, the new heaven and new earth is going to be developed. You're going to have other things to do. In the book of Revelation, when you see the streets of gold and the pearly gates and all that stuff, that's the city that came down out of heaven. That's not even heaven itself. So, it's not about heaven. It's about Jesus. It's not about hell. Although, if you continue to reject the Lord Jesus Christ, you will go to hell. And it will be because of you and your decision to choose that over Him. But, it's not about hell. It's not about heaven. It's always about one thing. Jesus Jesus only. He's the one that laid down his life. He's the one that purchased you. He's the one that is the, the, the groom. You're the bride. You're the church. You belong to him. How dare you and I think at any moment it is okay for us to hold back from him. He gets 100% of you. He gets everything that you are. Two gentlemen were traveling down the road. And one gentleman asked the other gentleman, said, what's the weather going to be today? And the one said, whatever pleases me. The other gentleman thought that's kind of arrogant. He said, what do you mean, whatever pleases you? He said, well, if it pleases my God, it pleases me. So whatever the weather may be is whatever pleases me. 
whatever comes, whatever's happening, whatever's going on, if it's pleasing to the Father, it's pleasing to me. If he says it's sin, I say it's sin. If he says it's right, it's right. If he says it's wrong, it's wrong. And if he says move left, you move left. And if he says keep on, you keep on. And if he says stop, stop. And if he says quit, quit. Quit living for you. Surrender to him. Father, I hope this helps somebody. In Jesus' name, amen.